Thank you, Julian, and thank you, everybody, for uh, including this uh, topic in the conversation, because really what we're seeing happening around us, obviously you all are observing uh, and participating in events, political events in Britain and all across Europe, uh, the, the, the rise of Jeremy Corbyn and the left wing of the Labour Party, and throughout Europe, what we're seeing is a discrediting of the uh, erstwhile ruling class and their political representatives. But uh, it's, it's important that we're including the United States also in this discussion, because really it's not a phenomenon that's just limited to the uh, European continent. Obviously, you're seeing it in a much more advanced way in Europe, but really it's unfolding. It's a generalized process uh, uh, unfolding on both sides of the Atlantic of a total the discrediting and a disenchantment with the ruling elite and a real um, sense of anger and frustration at the status quo. And it's especially reflected in the sentiments of young people. I think on both, on both continents, you're seeing uh, a developing revolt of young people. And a lot of what's happened in the United States obviously has been framed by Trump's election. So a lot of what I will uh, share with you today will center around that. But in reality, uh, we have to keep in mind that the Trump presidency is, and if you actually look at how it has developed in the last year, is really a reflection of the overall situation. And uh, the, the first point, of course, to note is that uh, it's almost a year since Trump took office. It's a year since he got elected. And uh, in all these months, and I know every, you know, we, we've heard, we've heard, we've seen this in the media, Every month, the media speculates whether this will be the last month that Trump will exist in, in the White House. And that question is not an idle question, or it, it, and it may sound funny and everything, but in reality, it contains, in that, that question contains a lot of uh, really uh, background, or should contain a lot of background of what's actually happening. And I think that, that's why this discussion is important. Clearly, the whole of Trump's presidency has been a presidency of crises. And now you're seeing such really, such dire aspects of it. We've seen the ongoing investigation of the possible collusion by Russia in last year's election. We have three of his former campaign staffers to have been indicted by the FBI, I mean, with criminal charges. And, uh, you know, this is, a, this is almost unheard of for three of the campaign aides of a sitting president to have been served charges criminal charges. Trump, in all his months in office, has not succeeded in passing a single significant piece of legislative agenda that he promised. You know, he talked about dismantling the Affordable Care Act, the health care, the, the, the small measure of health care that was put, put in place. And he promised to go under a huge attack on immigrant rights. And not that he didn't try, but it, it, it hasn't worked in the way that the right wing was, uh, was, was saying was going to happen. And what did we see when he first got elected? We saw mass protests. We saw student walkouts. We saw the largest day of protest ever in US history with the women's marches the day after inauguration. It was incredible. I, I, was, I was personally in DC. And it was Im impossible to see beyond you know, two feet from you because you were, you were surrounded by a veritable ocean of people, mostly young people, who were angry about what had happened and really uh, clearly, very decisively disagreed with the Trump, uh, sort of uh, not just the Trump agenda, but the, the vision of the right wing for society. And I think for a lot of people who, who uh, outside the United States might have been wondering what the consciousness is like in the United States, it's very clear. I mean, there's no ambiguity about it whatsoever. It's very clear that on the whole, American working people, young people of every demographic are completely rejecting this right, right wing sort of anti-immigrant, deeply misogynistic, racist vision of American society. 
And you can see also from the uh, tremendous anger that has been generated by these uh, just exp this explosive scandal of the revelation of uh, just systematic sexual harassment in Hollywood, you know, through the 50, more than 50 women who have come out and accused Harvey Weinstein, a real big shot in Hollywood. There have been revelations of systematic sexual harassment in the California state legislature. I mean, this is, this is incredible. So this is an era where people are starting to talk about things that they haven't talked about in decades. And a lot of this crisis is also... Uh, contained. I mean, you can, you can also see uh, in the crisis of the Republican Party, it's, it's, in, it's incredible to watch what is happening. On the one hand, the Republican Party, the Republican establishment, you know, the, 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 old, uh, the old, uh, old guard of the Republican establishment is feeling a deep squeeze. And I, and I say this not with sympathy for them, obviously, because as Marxists, as socialists, we have, we have nothing in common with any aspect of the Republican Party. We're completely opposed to the policies that have been put forward, the ideas that have been put forward by the Republican establishment. But it is also important for us to step back and uh, analyze the situation uh, within the ruling class because uh, we, if we don't have a correct analysis, a correct idea of what's happening within the ruling class, we will not judge accurately what we need to do as the working class. What, is, what, is, what, what are our actions supposed to be? And are we estimating what's happening in the ruling class accurately? It is important for us to not be complacent, but it's also important for us to not miss really important signals. And one of the important signals is that the Republican Party is in complete and utter crisis and chaos. It is, it is not possible to overemphasize this. It is, it's, 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 a, it's a really extreme crisis. Uh, and for the Republican establishment, for the old guard, as I said, what does this mean? I mean, they have, for, 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 especially since 2010, but now for years, in the new period, since the crisis of capitalism uh, sort of manifested itself in 2007, 2008, they've been dealing with what they considered was an element of the right wing, you know, the Tea Party wing and so on. And, but but what's, what's changed is something decisive here, and, and it's reflected by Trump's election, is that it, 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 it was something that the Republican establishment hoped was just an element that they had to deal with in the Republican Party. Now, with Trump's victory and uh, this dual phenomenon where on the one hand he is deeply unpopular among the overall American consciousness, but his popularity among his base is virtually untouched. That, that, that has meant that for the Republican establishment, they're being squeezed by the pro-Trump extreme right-wing element. In fact, last week there was a pro-Trump talk show host who said, we are not an element within the Republican Party. We are the party. And uh, you know, so the, 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 the mainstream of the Republican Party is running scared from the, the extreme right wing, the, especially the Christian right, the NRA, you know, the gun-toting gun NRA, the anti-immigrant forces, all of whom are still firmly behind Trump. And it is playing out in electoral terms. You know, next year is an extremely important congressional election year and state, state, statewide races. There'll be important statewide races for the Democrats and Republicans. But the extreme right wing uh, element, which is now, you know, saying that they're not just an element, but they're much more predominant, that they're going to, they're threatening to run extreme right wing candidates against mainstream Republican candidates. So on the one hand, the Republican Party is facing a squeeze from the extreme right wing. On the other hand, this year's election, there were many election races this year that were just declared a few days before, uh, before our meetings today. And what, th what these election results this year have revealed is, uh, uh, is a, I think we can call it a decisive repu repudiation of Trump and the right wing. So on the one hand, the Republican establishment is struggling within its, with, you know, with a sort of rebellion or extreme right-wing rebellion within its own party, which has been extremely emboldened by Trump's election. On the other hand, this year's election reveal that many, many voters are going out to vote simply because they want to express their anger against Trump. This year, the Democrats won many races, decisive races throughout the country. 
Uh, one of them, uh, one of the main ones being the election of uh, the governor of Virginia, the Virginia governor's race, is really revealing of what's happening. The Republican candidate in that race, Ed Gillespie, was a major Trumpite. You know, Trump actually was, uh, in, in his, all his wisdom, he was trying to, uh, you know, promote Ed Gillespie's race, and he was tweeting about him, you know, he was all over the world. He was in Europe, I think, when the election was going on. He was tweeting in favor of Ed Gillespie. But this guy, this Republican, lost handily to a, to a no-name Democrat. In fact, one of the left-wing newspapers called this Democrat, his name is Ralph Northam, he's, 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 a, he's a nobody. I mean, I, I have not heard his name since, uh, you know, uh, uh, before this race. And he was called a wet bag of mulch. In other words, that uh, the, re uh, the, the Trump wing of the Republican Party is so deeply unpopular that voters will go out and vote for a wet bag of mulch if it means making a statement against Trump. And this is important because this Democrat, Ralph Northam, who nobody had heard of before, not only won by a margin of nine percentage points, which is a significant margin, he also won more votes than any previous candidate for Virginia governor ever. So this is, this is quite, quite, a, a, quite a significant result that we're seeing here. And so this year's results do point broadly to the Democratic Party winning the midterms next year. And next year is going to be a key year already. Most of the political commentary is about, you know, perspectives for next year. What do we think is going to happen next year? Uh, so what's happened as a consequence of the election results is that many Democratic, uh, you know, mainstream Democratic political commentators have started arguing that the election results this year show that Trump's election last year does not re re represent or any kind of generalized revolt against the corporate establishment or the political establishment that, and now uh, new, co new commentaries have emerged that say that, well, you know, it, Trump, you know, uh, left-wing people were comparing Trump's election to Brexit and, you know, that it, it like, similar, similar to Brexit, Trump's election was an expression of anger, just general anger and a rejection of the establishment as a whole. So now Democratic commentators are saying, maybe that's not true at all. And they're trying to assure the Democratic establishment you don't need to panic. You don't need to uh, cower in front of these left-wing, pesky left-wing forces because the, people will come out and vote against Trump, so you don't have to worry about it. So that's the conclusion they're reaching. But we have to be careful that, to know that that is actually a very simplistic and inaccurate analysis. Why is that? And this is where uh, socialist alternatives analysis is extremely important. The CWI's analysis is extremely important. One thing to notice from this year's election races, and, and I don't expect that any of you have had a chance to look at it, look at them, but I can share with you a lot of the results that came out this year. Yes, they do show a support for the Democratic Party. They do show a repudiation of Trump. There is no doubt about it. But within that, there is something more happening, and if we miss that story, it will be a major loss for the left if we miss that part of the story, which is that within the Democratic Party victories, the candidates that won in, a, in many of those races, more significant than even we would have thought, were left-wing candidates, candidates that were fielded, for example, fielded by, uh, for example, by the Democratic Socialists of America, DSA. This year, we have a very good statistic uh, to let us know what's happening. DSA saw 56% of the candidates they supported elected this year as compared to 20% in the last electoral cycle. So this is a major shift in the kind of candidates that are being elected on the Democratic Party ticket. So just to give you an example, the, the guy who won the district attorney's race in Philadelphia, which is a very key race you know, for district attorney, uh, the guy who won the race on the Democratic Party ticket is a, uh, a left-leaning civil rights attorney, Larry Krasner, who has sued the police many times. This is a very un, un, this is this profile for somebody to be elected on a democratic ticket is very uncharacteristic of the democratic establishment. It, you know, such, such a thing not, does not usually happen. Another key race I can mention is in, um, in uh, Virginia, I believe, uh, there were two people running. The Republican who was running was an extreme right-wing, homophobic, anti-trans community uh, candidate who promised to, and who tried many times to institute draconian bathroom laws preventing trans people from using gender neutral bathrooms or women's bathrooms and so on, you know, transgender women from using bathrooms, uh, women's bathrooms. So against this guy, 
we had a transgender woman running as a Democrat, and she won handily against him. So a transgender woman running as a Democrat won handily against a right-wing Republican who was anti-transgender. So these are, these are indications that, yes, it's an opposition to right-wing ideas, which is, you know, confirms socialist alternative analysis all along, that Trump's election does not in any way represent American working class and young people moving to, to the right. But the election results are showing something deeper also, that even within the Democratic Party, there is something of an element of a party within the party. I mean, there is a force called Our Revolution that Bernie Sanders launched after he lost the Democratic nomination. And there are many weaknesses, and I don't want to make the mistake of overstating it, uh, because they, the, our, our revolution is not, it's not like a membership organization. They don't have any structures for an organization yet, but they are somewhat of a force that is becoming more and more prominent. And in this year's election, our revolution candidates, you know, candidates who are Democrat, but were endorsed by the our revolution wing within the Democratic Party, had uh, made many gains. And so while, um, while the Democratic Party establishment is making a lot of overtures towards unity, you know, they talk about party unity, and of course we should know that when they say party unity, they mean unity with the corporate agenda, unity with the agenda of the establishment of the Democratic Party that is very much uh, married to Wall Street interests, billionaire interests, and so on. But uh, uh, it's the, the, the call for unity is not being taken up in the way that they want to. I mean, it's a complex process. On the one hand, more and more people are actually, young people especially, young people who are newly politicized now, who hadn't wo voted before last year and so on, uh, they do want to try the Democratic Party out, you know, to see if it fits, to see if we can actually push for a left-wing agenda within the Democratic Party. It's a legitimate question. From their standpoint, they're asking a legitimate question. You know, can we move a left-wing agenda forward? Can we win concrete demands like uh, addressing the student debt, having, uh, like Bernie Sanders raised in his campaign, taxing Wall Street to fund high-quality, affordable public education and universities? Can we... Uh, make the uh, pharmaceutical and ins insurance industries pay to have affordable health care for all, you know, uh, as, as we call in the United States, single-payer health care. So uh, in, in that sense, there is a push towards trying the Democratic Party out, but it is not the kind of unity the Democratic establishment wants. There is a, an increasing, more than ever in our lifetimes, there's a real push, a, a systematic push to see if the Democratic Party can be moved to the left. And on the other hand, the establishment of the Democratic Party itself is extremely nervous about the rise of left-wing ideas. They're very scared, especially of young people who speak their mind. Young people have, who have not spent 30 years having uh, declared their loyalty to the democratic establishment and feeling scared of speaking openly. Young people are speaking openly. They, they speak very clearly about their anger at the democratic establishment, about Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer. These are the, you know, the, the old time leaders, totally corporate, thoroughly uh, corporate, disgusting leaders of the democratic party. Young people are extremely angry and disgusted by them and they speak openly about it. And so in their nervousness, the democratic establishment has also not just stayed, you know, just it's not just quiescently accepting the left-wing forces within its party. They are fighting back. The establishment is fighting back. So one of the things they did was uh, carried out somewhat of a purge, you know, an emptying of the democratic leadership, the party leadership, the national committee leadership. From you know, they removed several key. Uh, pro-Bernie leaders and put in place, this happened just a week and a half ago, and they put in place Hillary Clintonites, you know, some people from her campaign. They also significantly, when they removed the Bernie people from the leadership of the party, they didn't just put Clinton folks, they also put corporate lobbyists. I mean, this is the exact opposite of what people are saying the Democratic Party should do. So it's in, in many ways, the Democratic Party is tone deaf and also to the extent that they realize the crisis that is, that is on their hands, they are extremely, unreluct, uh, extremely reluctant to do anything about it. So m the point being that there is no question there is a deep crisis in the Republican Party, but there is also a crisis in the Democratic Party. Just uh, last week, the latest issue of Vanity Fair said, the Republican Party isn't the only political establishment in shambles following the shock election of Donald Trump last year. 
uh, in a move that exacerbated the vast intra-party rift exposed during last year's presidential primary, the Democratic National Committee has stripped a number of longtime party officials of their delegate status while appointing a slate of 75 new members that include Clinton campaign veterans, lobbyists, and neophytes. There will surely be a revolt against this. So we can see that even uh, you know, political commentators, analysts are noticing that this is not going to be the last word that the democratic establishment will have on this subject. There's a new poll, a Harvard poll, that finds that the majority of Democrats and the overwhelming majority of young Democrats believe that the party is very insufficiently to the left. 69% of Democrats aged 18 to 34 say that they strongly support left movements taking the Democratic Party over. Of course, we as Marxists, we have to engage in this question. Uh, we, we, we don't agree. Socialist alternative doesn't agree that the Democratic Party can be moved to the left. We have been raising the question of how our movements, our struggles, uh, working class need our own political representation and it's not going to work to put our faith in the Democratic Party. But at the same time, socialist alternative and activists on the left have an obligation. You know, if we are truly serious about building the left, we have an obligation to not be sort of dis not distance ourselves from uh, the, the grappling that many young people are going through. You know, if, if young people feel that maybe we should try the Democratic Party out, our job is not to be condescending to them or stand on the sidelines from them, but really engage with them on this question and, 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 and you know, uh, discuss uh, how, how, why we feel that's not going to work and also how things are playing out this year and how they will, they will play out next year. There is one big indication of where consciousness is, and, and the Democratic Party would really, really like, like to forget this. And that is the fact that, I mean, the Democratic Party establishment would like to forget this. And that is the fact that Bernie Sanders is by far the most popular politician in the United States. He is popular not only among people in general, like, you know, in the general polls, he is by far, by, and I, when I say by far, it means you know, by num, in, in the terms of numbers, he's you know, way ahead of any other politician. But he is most popular not just among people in general or white people. He is the most popular by far among African Americans, black people, among Latinos, among young people, among women. So in every demographic, it is clear that consciousness is well to the left of what the Democratic Party can offer to these people. So that process is going to play out. Trump is still the most uh, you know, unpopular um, uh, politician, but he, uh, you know, there's somebody else who is almost on his heels, and that's Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and there's other people who actually have deeper unpopularity than Trump, and I believe that's Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, who are both Democrats. Uh, and also uh, other mainstream Republicans like Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan. I mean, uh, uh, you know, his favorable, Trump's favorability rating is actually higher than Clinton's and also uh, than uh, Nancy Pelosi and all these people. So, you know, that also shows you what's happening overall in the nation. So I think uh, there's a lot, lot for us to uh, look at and understand that while there is a widespread rejection of Trump and the right-wing agenda, which is very important. And as I said before, it strongly confirms socialist alternatives analysis that we put forward when Trump was elected. But at the same time, it also bolsters our, uh, you know, our, our prediction that there will be a broader left critique of the Democratic Party that is not going to go away. And, and it's, in, it, it's important to observe that this critique, the left critique of the Democratic Party is not going away simply because Trump is floundering. I mean, Trump is in deep crisis and he is, you know, he's, uh, there's every day there's a new thing that we have to contend with. There's the possibility of uh, extremely rash uh, and destructive decisions related to North Korea. He, you know, the, uh, he is threatening to fire Mueller, who's the in independent investigator on the whole Russia collusion. He's doing unbalanced things every day, and we hear about how his staff are, uh, you know, are trying desperately to corral him from doing more damage. But what's interesting here, comrades, for us to observe is that despite the deep crisis that Trump is in, 
And it's undeniable the crisis he is in. It's undeniable the crisis that the Republican Party is in. But despite all that, workers and young people are not drawing simplistic conclusions. They are actually demanding a move towards the left. And that, that process is playing out. I'd like to share a really uh, revealing statistic with you all. While you know the Democratic establishment has decided they're going to hammer away on the question of Trump. In fact, they'll also say you know, informally that it's better if Trump is in office, it's better if he's not driven out, because then we can use him thoroughly in the 2018 congressional and state races to you know, make easy gains. It's such an easy battle to fight. You know, like Trump is crazy. I mean, that's not, it doesn't take much to make that argument, because he is crazy. Uh, it doesn't, make, uh, it doesn't take much to make the argument that he's completely unbalanced and dangerous uh, and, a, uh, and a real rogue element. So they are hammering de determinedly at Trump, uh, and they're going to do so in 2018 as well. But look at the statistics that we see from, uh, this was a poll that was re released just a few days ago uh, from registered voters. You know, all the voters who say that they are likely to vote in the, in the next year's election. 47%, which is nearly half of the voters polled, say that Trump will not be a factor in their decision to vote next year. This is, it is quite a revealing statistic. And in that same poll, they found that similar percentages of registered voters say they are motivated to vote to express opposition to Trump as are people who say that they're going to express support for Trump. So it's a similar percentage of people who say they'll vote because they like Trump, and similar who say, who say they'll vote because they hate Trump. And, and aside from that, those groups, 47%, nearly half of the population says that Trump will not be a factor. I know we, we should not overstate this. You know, obviously, Trump is a factor overall. You know, it's, it sort of looms large over everything. But, it, but it's a reminder for us that uh, it is not just about Trump for a lot of people. As a matter of fact, right now it is uh, a lot of what people are thinking, the, a lot of the churn that's happening in people's minds right now is about concrete issues. I mean, the question of single-payer health care, the question of immigration status, and I'd like to mention one thing before I end because it's, it's just now happening and it's a key development that we should keep, uh, keep an eye on. Um, uh, you know, it, it shows that pe people are starting to question the political establishment on the question of concrete demands and question and, and, and asking themselves, you know, why is it that the Democrats are not fighting on these questions at the same time that they are angry about Trump and are probably, you know, very likely to end up giving the Democrats the biggest gains next year. So we have to we have to look at it in that way. And this process is also reflected on the question of impeachment. You know, there has been there, there have been demands for impeachment both by ordinary people and also by the powers that be. Recently, there was, uh, I think just a week or a week and a half ago, there was a key article in the Guardian newspaper in which uh, Democratic, billion, Democratic Party supporting billionaire st uh, Steyer, he has he is, he launched a petition calling for impeachment and urging that the Democrats immediately take action. That petition has been signed by two million people. So. Of course, there is a there, that question, you know, is 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 in the air. Like, what do we do? Like, how do we get Trump out? Can there be an impeachment and so on? I think that uh, while while ordinary people are talking about impeachment, uh, it, it is it is important to also point out that they're not just talking about impeachment. As I said, they're talking about concrete issues. How do we defeat the right wing? on the immigration question and so on. And it's also important to see that the Democratic Party, I mean, the, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are two forces that could actually carry out impeachment. You know, so it's important for us to look at what is going on there. Have they made moves in any serious way? And they haven't. The Republican Party is not going to, and the reason is fairly obvious, because as I said, the, the mainstream of the Republican Party is extremely scared and nervous right now, the right-wing element, and they are not about to do something that will majorly anger Trump's base. They can't afford that battle right now. They have to play it safe for 2018. But the Democrats are also not about to do it either, and I think it's really instructive. I mean, obviously, we can't say it won't happen in a definitive way, but it is instructive to look at what happened in the Nixon era. You know, Nixon, uh, and you know, I think there are, it's fair to compare in some ways the Nixon era and the Trump era because Nixon uh, was the last such president, um, although not in Trump's league. I mean, nobody is in Trump's league, and Trump is in a league of his own. But 
But it's similar, it's a similar process. You know, the Watergate scandal, other scandals that happened. It was a, it was a complete, uh, just sort of a takedown, like a completely humiliating public takedown of a president that ever happened when, when Nixon had to leave. But the thing to notice is that it was more than two years after the Watergate scandal first broke out that he was forced to resign. And that whole period reflected how neither the Republicans nor the Democrats were willing to take the steps forward. And, and partly, obviously, we have to recognize that, uh, you know, that there is competition within the ruling class, you know, among, you know, against one another, against, uh, you know, between the forces within the ruling class. But, but the ruling class as a whole also has its own interests that are common with one another against the rest of society, against the working class. So for Trump to be impeached and taken down will be not only a repudiation of Trump himself, it will be a takedown of the uh, political establishment as a whole. And the establishment is loath to, do, to have to do that if they have other routes to carry out the same process. I mean, they would like Trump out. Many of them would like Trump out. But it's not an easy question for them about impeachment. And uh, I think the, the main lesson to be drawn from the Nixon era, one, is that at that time, the Democrats had the majorities in both houses, and yet they did not take, they, take the real moves for impeachment. What really brought Nixon down was not primarily the formal question of impeachment. It was the fact that mass movements had reach such a crescendo at that point and sort of uh, and movements around different issues were coalescing with one another that that social force of the labor movement of working people and so on that presented such a major challenge and threat to the establishment as a whole that getting Nixon out of there became a prerequisite for them to somehow consolidate their power against this rising social force. And that is the main element I think we have to draw out from that era and, and understand that, again, in this period, that aspect is not going to be different. The working class will, and young people, and social movements around various issues will be the decisive factor and have to be the decisive factor in, what ha in how events play out in the next couple of years. I mean, it's really, really uh, uh, important and, and educational to, to remember that it was in the Nixon era that some of the large, uh, some of the most significant social gains of the last 40 years were won. It was under Nixon that the Environmental Protection Agency was formed, that the Occupational Safety and Health Act was passed, that the Roe v. Wade decision, which was a landmark Supreme Court decision that finally gave abortion rights to women, was passed, and most significantly, the Vietnam War was ended under Nixon. And none of this happened because Nixon was a closet socialist. He was a, uh, he was a nasty, racist, misogynist, bigot, uh, pro-billionaire. But it happened because social forces, uh, you know, completely shifted the balance of forces. And that, th that lesson plays out completely today as well. And I'll end on this note. For, for, for the left in America, and the left everywhere indeed, and, and young people and those of you who are here because you're curious about socialism and you want to understand what role you can play, I think it's important to see that uh, it, what, what will determine the course of history in the United States as everywhere else in the next period, in the coming period, will be how these social forces form. Right now, we've seen a tremendous result for Socialist Alternatives election campaign in Minneapolis, where Ginger Jensen was our candidate. She already had a tremendous profile. She had launched, she and our organization had launched the 15 Now organization that we had launched originally in Seattle. And as Juliet mentioned, we won 15 in Seattle first. But earlier this year, 15 Now in Minnesota, after a bitter two-year struggle, just won $15 an hour. And that was, uh, you know, uh, through in part uh, Ginger's leadership. And we used that to run Ginger for office. And while we didn't win the election itself, we have made a huge mark on the consciousness of working people and young people, especially university students in Minneapolis, because we have raised the banner of fighting against inequality, of taxing the rich to fund education, of rent control, because affordable housing is now the burning issue in every major US city. But what, what, 
but, but, the, but the main lesson to draw from Ginger's campaign is that the harnessing of the latent anger in society is not an automatic thing. You know, you don't just, it doesn't, doesn't just automatically happen. It needs a decisive leadership on the left to channel that into real action, to bring people together, to get organized around uh, struggles for concrete demands. And that is what the Ginger campaign has done uh, that by, by running this campaign and by uh, decisively having a do ground game. You know, we door knocked every door. I mean, to the point that the people at the door started telling us, please don't come anymore. I'm voting for Ginger, but, do but I don't want to have this conversation anymore. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's testament to how uh, you know, tremendous our campaign was, our hundreds of uh, our comrades who went from all over the country to fight for her campaign. And it, we can say very confidently that the establishment won the election by gaming the system, but they didn't win it on the basis of ideas. On the basis of ideas, we won the election. And for us, it's not going to be the end of the road, that election campaign. We're going to use that for, for building further struggles. But that is a lesson for the US left as a whole. If we are to actually bring down Trump, if we are to actually prevent a larger uh, and a more uh, politicized uh, right-wing force from emerging, if we are to fight against corporations, if we are to fight against climate change, if we are to fight against misogyny and racism and police brutality, really what we will need is decisive leadership from the left, from the US labor movement, and from young people in particular. Let's stop there.